Okay, as promised, we're picking right up where we left off. So as foils, right, the philosophy of Wolf Larsen is going to be the opposite of the philosophy of Humphrey Van Weyden. Humphrey Van Weyden is the philosophical tradition of the West, right, that includes all of these traditional things. And Nietzsche, right, who was trying to kind of write against all of these Western philosophy traditions, right, he's the opponent of that. So we know that they are very different. In order to highlight how they're different philosophically, they're also very different physically. We know that Wolf Larsen is the apex predator. He's a monster of a man, right? He's, he has inhuman, superhuman strength, while Hump, Humphrey Van Weyden, is frail, a weakling. He's even called repeatedly in the book, he's referring to his past, he's even called a sissy, referring to him as being effeminate. Effeminate. Right? That means that he's too much like a female. And, you know, nowadays, right, because there's a lot more controversy over gender, right, if you call someone a sissy or effeminate, people get a lot more, uh, people get a lot more offended. But in the context of Jack London, you have to remember that he's writing in the time of he's, you know, Superman's man. And so to call someone a sissy or call them effeminate, that's a really big deal. And back then, it was basically a rejection of a whole person, right? It's to reject, to challenge someone's manhood back then, that's fighting work. Right? It, is, it is a huge, huge deal. So we know that Humphrey is physically weak, and he has to get stronger throughout the, the text. He has to become more and more, in some ways, at least physically, like Wolf Larsen. In that way, we see that this is one of the ways in which Nietzsche is being honored by Jack London in the text. Remember how in The Call of the Wild, a dog has to start out domestic and has to end up becoming wild in order to be able to survive? In that way, that's kind of what we're seeing with Humphrey Van Weyden, right? Humphrey Van Weyden, in his philosophy, he particularly supports this thing called altruism, right? Which means doing good for others, right? Just doing good for others because it's good, right? Right? And what we have in Wolf Larsen, what does he represent? He represents survival of the fist. Right? It's every man for himself, homo homini lupus. And what does that mean? What's the Latin? Man is to man a wolf, right? And so these are the two major, these are the two major philosophies that are going to be put to the test in terms of uh, what we mean and what's going on uh, in the book. Now, one of the things that we should remember about Jack London are some of his personal views, right? We well remember, right, that Jack London very much believed in this thing called eugenics. Meaning he believed that genes determined one's value to a large extent, right? And the philosophy of eugenics is the philosophy of human husbandry, right? It's the philosophy of human husbandry and what that means is, if you don't know what husbandry is, it means selective breeding. It means that people believe philosophically that only the fittest humans, both intellectually and, and uh, physically, should breed with other super fit humans and let the weaker ones die in order to create a better race or a better group of human beings. We have still seen this in sports, right? We can see that when uh, various governments force people to selectively breed, they can breed better athletes. My favorite example is Vitaly and Vladimir Klitschko, who were both world heavyweight boxing champions, chess masters, and PhDs. And in order to be able to be that smart and that athletic, I mean, that's the result of four generations of state-sponsored selective breeding. So that's the philosophy of eugenics. The other thing we should remember about Jack London was Jack London was a socialist, right? He believed in the redistribution of wealth. He was very much anti the rich. He was anti the plight of the poor. And he was also a materialist, right? Now, a materialist, if you remember what that is, that means there's one kind of stuff, right? 
that means that things like the soul doesn't exist, right? The spiritual world doesn't exist. God doesn't exist. All that exists is matter and energy, okay? He wouldn't have said it that way, but that was the philosophy that Jack London had. The interesting thing about looking at Jack London's philosophy, who is someone who actually does believe in eugenics, he is a materialist, and yet also a socialist. The weird thing about London is a lot of the things that Wolf Larsen believes, Jack London also believes. But the big difference between Jack London and Wolf Larsen is their position on morality. For Wolf Larsen, right, no God and no soul, right, there's no reward, so there's no heaven or hell, so there's no real reason to be moral, equals no morality, right? If this world is all there is, not only do I only care about myself, but I don't even care about a spouse or children. Screw it. It's just yeast eating yeast, dog eating dog, every man for himself. He said, I cut out the race and the children. When, when Humphrey Van Weyden says one has a uh, responsibility to himself and the human race and his children, you know, uh, Wolf Larson actually says, I cut out the race and the children, right? But for London, right, even though he also, does not necessarily believe in God and the soul, London still believes in morals. And so, in this way, London is also different than Humphrey Van Weyden, who does believe in the soul, who does believe in God, who does believe in the objective good. Uh, these are not things that Jack London believes. But the tension, right, between Wolf Larsen and Humphrey Van Weyden is, right, Larson thinks, right, no soul equals no morality, right? And then you have uh, Van Weyden, Hump, right, who, right, isn't, he's not able to defeat uh, Wolf's arguments about the soul, but he believes there has to be morality no matter what. The interesting thing about it is you actually discover Jack London's philosophy not when you look at Wolf Larsen and not even when you look at Humphrey Van Weyden. It's in between. What London is actually trying to help us to understand his viewpoint in this book is that the truth lies somewhere in the middle, somewhere between domesticity and the wild, somewhere between materialism and morality. There is this middle ground in order to justify what is real and what is really good. There's a philosopher who's mentioned in the text, right, who you should know, who has the name Herbert Spencer. And he's the one who coins that term survival of the fittest. That's usually attributed to Charles Darwin, but it's actually not Darwin who said it, it's Herbert Spencer. And so one of the things, as their philosophies compete, right, this is a fight for survival between Wolf Larsen and Humphrey Van Weyden, and it's a survival of fitness, meaning who is going to survive in the long term, who's going to pass their genes on, right? And so the, the, the fight between them is a fight for survival of philosophies. And the reason why this becomes super important, right, is because at this point in the novel, about halfway through, there's a whole new character that's being introduced. That character being Maude Brewster. Now, we don't know much about Maude Brewster yet. We've just met her. This is her name. Maud Brewster, right? This is the romance part of the book. A lot of people don't like it. I love it personally, but what are you going to do? Maud Brewster is a writer, which, of course, is totally uh, going to make sense because, you know, of course, Humphrey Van Weyden is a literary critic. Critic, It's going to be, you know, a match made in, you know, utter random chance, right? Random chance and, in some ways, bad cliche accidental writing. But the point is, is that Maud Brewster, right, in terms of a competition of who is more fit, it's not only a competition 
for survival. It's a competition to pass on your genes. So in this love triangle, that's the term for when we have these competitions for affections, in this love triangle, Maud Brewster, it's her role as the woman in deciding which man she's going to go with. She's the one who's deciding which philosophy is more fit, which philosophy is more akin to survival. As we've seen, right, Humphrey has had to become somewhat like Wolf Larsen in certain ways, but there are certain things that he's not going to want to change about himself. We know that Hump has gotten a lot physically stronger. He's become a capable seaman. He has had to learn how to survive among bullies and thieves, right? This has been a pretty trying time for Mr. Van Waden all in all, right? But the key that we have going up, the real heat between him and Wolf Larsen is going to happen now that they're going to be in competition for Maud Brewster. That's going to be what really heats it up, and that's what's really going to eventually escalate uh, the whole story into its final conclusion. Now, there are a few other characters that we should remember. So the three main characters that we, we know are Humphrey Van Witten, right? because he's the protagonist, he's the, the one who represents classical Western philosophy, belief in the soul, belief in morality. There is Wolf Larsen, who represents materialism and the Ubermensch of Friedrich Nietzsche. There's Maud Brewster, who is philosophically a lot more like Humphrey Van Waden, but she's the woman who's going to decide which one of them is more fit, which one of them is more apt for survival. But outside those three main characters, we also have a couple of other characters. We have Cookie, Right, who is kind of representing the lower form of human. Right, Cookie is the cook, Thomas Mugridge, as you may remember. This is referring to the idea that certain people are born kind of on different levels of the evolutionary scale. That is a very racist world viewpoint, but Jack London can't, can't say he wasn't exactly racist, right? There is also Johnson, He's the good sailor who we know that Wolf Larsen likes to torment. Now, we shouldn't confuse Johnson with Johansson or Johansson, right? Remember, there's the mate, right? If you think of Scarlett Johansson, think of mating, okay? I should have said that better. But you get what I mean. Johansson is the mate, and he gets murdered, right? He's cast overboard and presumably drowned by the young man George Leach who also is a target for torment by Captain Larson. Johansson is the good man, and George Leach is this kind of impetuous, fiery youth who uh, he has tr attempted to kill Larson a few times, right? The behavior of George Leach trying to kill Wolf Larson, who could kill Wolf at any time, is to remind us that Wolf Larson is this weird, exceptional individual in modern terms, we would call Wolf Larsen a sociopath. He is a high-functioning, high-intelligent, completely without empathy, completely without remorse. He is, you know, this, this high-functioning sociopath. And that's the thing. Like, his behavior towards people, sometimes cruel, sometimes friendly, it's always to serve his own needs and his own interests. He's really without interest in anybody else. Okay. And so the fact that he allows George Leach to live uh, just because he likes the thrill of maybe being killed by him is just reminding us more and more of Wolf Larson's kind of weird, diminished mental state. Okay, so uh, I'm going to stop right here. Don't worry. We're going to pick right back up where we left off.